So this is my talk, Classification and Clustering with Wine and Chocolate. Um, and sorry, there is no wine or chocolate. But nevertheless, you're going to learn something about them today. So, but first, let's talk a little bit about me. So I actually, I lived in Seattle for 10 years. Uh, I did my uh, undergrad here at the University of Washington. You can see this here, my UW there. Um, I actually have a BS in biology from UW. Uh, we don't need to know the year that I graduated. Um, but after that, uh, I went and I got a, actually I was going to be a middle school teacher, and I decided that that was kind of terrible. And so then I went and I got a, I said, what am I going to do with my life? I guess I'll go be a computer scientist. So I went and got my master's in computer science uh, from Santa Clara in the Bay Area, and that's where I live now. I got that in 2012. So I've worked as a software engineer for about the last six years since I graduated, and I've always worked on distributed databases. Somehow that became my passion. I think I've worked on four different distributed databases. Um, I've worked at Lockheed Martin, HP, Teradata, uh, a startup called Estgen. I'm also, uh, and now I'm a developer advocate for Datastax. So I'm an Apache committer and PMC member on a project called Trafodian. It is a SQL on HBase uh, solution. And I did all the in initial installation and deployment work for that project. And then just my fun things about me is that I love Disney, I love the cloud, I love dogs, Linux, and obviously distributed databases. So what are we going to talk about today? So first, what problem are we really trying to solve here, right? These are the important questions. Can I use a clustering machine learning algorithm to find which wine came from which vineyard? Okay. And then can I use a classification machine learning algorithm to find which country a candy bar comes from, right? Think about like, a, what is it, a Mars bar? Those come from Europe and M&Ms come from America, like that. So, but first, before we get into that, we're gonna talk, we're gonna do an introduction to Apache Cassandra. I know this is Seattle Scalability. This is probably something most of you are very familiar with. So we're just gonna do a brief introduction to these things. Uh, a very brief introduction to Apache Spark. Again, probably this crowd knows this like the back of their hand, but we're gonna do it very quickly just to make sure we're all on the same page. Then we're gonna talk about why are we talking about Cassandra and Spark together with these machine learning uh, algorithms. And we're gonna bring that all together. Then we're gonna do what is k-means, because that's gonna be the machine learning algorithm we're gonna use for our clustering. And then we're gonna talk about naive bays, which is what we're gonna use for classification. And we're gonna use that on our chocolate. We're gonna have two demos with that as well. So again, the problem we're really trying to solve here, can I use machine learning with Apache Spark with wine and chocolate. And yes, you can. But the main goal around this for me is what I'm trying to convey to all of you is that data analytics doesn't have to be complicated. A lot of times you're seeing these types of things and it's always on very complicated use cases. But if you just scale it down to something simple, you can learn how to use it and then go off and do your complicated use cases from there. So we're gonna user analyze the power of big data using Apache Cassandra, Apache Spark, Spark Machine Learning Libraries, uh, Jupyter Notebooks and Python. That's what I'm going to show you in the demo. So let's talk a little bit about Apache Cassandra. So it was developed by Facebook and, uh, and donated into the open source community, community around 2008, and then it graduated to a top level project in 2010. Now I was actually with, uh, like I said, an Apache project that went from incubation all the way to graduation, and I can tell you what a strenuous process this actually is to actually get your uh, project committed and uh, graduated to top level. So because of that, you know that this is a product that the community has really gathered around and are supporting very strongly. Uh, the Apache Foundation is very strong on that. Um, so what it is is a distributed decentralized database. It's elastically scalable. You can add and remove nodes with no downtime. It has high performance, it's very fast, has high availability and low fault tolerance. There's no single point of failure. Just gonna let that sink in. That's one of my favorite things. Uh, and one of the reasons I actually came to Datastax, because once I learned a little bit more about it and why it truly does have no single point of failure, I was on board because all the other products I'd ever, ever worked on had the opposite of that, like a million points of failure. So this is very exciting for me. And it solves many of the problems faced with traditional databases. Uh, for certain workloads, right? When we're talking about NoSQL, it has its place. Relational database, it has its place, right? So what does this all mean? So let's talk about four big topics in the NoSQL or Apache Cassandra space. Distributed, replication, elastically scalable, and high availability. So distributed, every node in the cluster has the exact same role. 
So I put here, really. That's actually true. Uh, Cassandra does not have a master worker architecture. So any client can connect to any node, and all nodes are read and write ready. But this is not to say that all nodes contain all the data, right? That just doesn't make sense. So that's when we're going to talk about replication here. So to be able to survive a node going down, uh, the, da the data obviously needs to be copied because we're talking about a distributed system, right? It needs to be copied to the other nodes. So the replication factor, how many times your data is going to be copied, uh, is actually set by the user, right? So maybe if you're working with um, data that you don't really mind if it were to be lost, right? Maybe some IoT sensor data, something like that. That if I lose one node of you know a couple of hours worth of data, I'm okay with just losing that. That's fine. I can just have my replication factor set to one. If I have uh, incredibly important data that I can't, I can't stand to lose, then maybe I would set it all the way to the number of nodes that I actually have in my cluster. We don't really recommend that. It's kind of overkill. Uh, probably just three copies of the data is probably plenty. So the data is asyn asynchronously replicated across the nodes. So that's automatic, and it's peer-to-peer, -peer, and it's really within milliseconds. So elastically scalable. So as you add more nodes, uh, the performance actually will increase linearly. Uh, you can scale up and scale down with no downtime. You don't even need a restart, which is actually really surprising to me and, and pretty cool. <laughs> Reads and writes both scale linearly. So this is just actually just a little graphic from Netflix showing that as they added more nodes, they were able to have more um, client writes. So let's talk about high availability. So again, this lack of single point of failure, this lack of a master node, allows for high availability because there is, and that means there's no single point of failure. So replication allows nodes to fail and data to still be available, right? Because now my data is distributed across nodes. If I lose one, I'm still good to go. So Cassandra expects nodes to fail and it doesn't panic. So multiple data center support is also right out of the box, even uh, multi-cloud support. So I just always like to bring this up because I'm an engineer and talking to other engineers. So we've talked about a lot of magic, right? Cassandra, Apache Cassandra, seems like it's kind of magical. But there's got to be some kind of trade-off, right? And so that's what I like to bring up, because I don't want to sound like I'm trying to sell something that maybe isn't true. So um, you should definitely check out this, the CAP theorem. It basically says that at any one point in time, if you have a network failure, you can only have so many of these things at one particular time. You can either have, you can have availability, consistency, and partitioning. Those are the three things, but you can only have two when you have a network failure. So because of this, it's impossible to have all three during a network failure. Cassandra chooses to be eventually consistent. So eventually consistent means it does not have acid transactions. And that's for Apache Cassandra and really any NoSQL database. So you can prioritize consistency over availability. These are things that are actually tunable uh, by you. So this is just kind of why you might need Cassandra if you have big data, you, have, you need high throughput, high availability. So we're going to do a really brief introduction to Apache Spark. And then here very soon we're going to be wrapping this all together of why we're talking about these things before we start talking about machine learning. So Apache Spark is a unified analytics engine for large-scale data processing. OK. <laughs> so right, so we have our data stored in Cassandra. And then we can do analytics on top of it using Apache Spark. So it's 100 times faster than Hadoop for analytics. And it utilizes in-memory processing to get that speed. So we're going to be using some of the Spark ML lib uh, libraries. And so those are located there. There's also Spark uh, SQL, Spark Streaming, GraphX, and Spark with R. So then what is DataStax Analytics? This is where we're wrapping this all together. So just a quick word about this, because I just want to mention it, because this is actually what I'm going to be doing the demo with. It's actually installed here just on my laptop as a single node. So with DataStax Analytics, you have Spark and Cassandra combined together. So you're not having to move the data that you have stored in Cassandra off into another Spark cluster. They're co-located on the same node. So you have uh, Spark executors and Cassandra um, all located on the same node. They're just not in the same JVM. So on each node, you'll have your Cassandra and the connector and then into Spark. And that's where you can do use your Spark ML lib. All right. So now we kind of have an understanding of where our data is going to live and how we're going to actually be able to run these. So now let's talk about what we're actually going to run. So what is clustering? 
So clustering algorithms are, it's pretty much just as simple as what you would imagine, right? Um, it's basically trying to group certain things into um, clusters or um, groups, right? So it's the task of actually grouping these objects into, the same, into different groups. So, and you want the things to be in that group as similar as possible. It's pretty straightforward. But so then what is k-means? k-means is an implementation of these clustering algorithms. And it's basically, it's a very simple, unsupervised learning algorithm that's used to solve clustering problems. So it follows a simple procedure of classifying a given data set into a number of clusters, defined by the letter k. So you actually define how many clusters you want before you start running the algorithm. Uh, so it's fixed beforehand. So with k-means, it's not, it's not going to determine the number of clusters that you have. You're telling it, I want these number of clusters, and then classify my data as such. And hopefully this will become a little bit more clear as we walk through the demo. So the clusters are positioned as points, and all observation or data points are associated with the nearest cluster. Right? They pick a point, and then they try to assign each one to fit the centroid of those clusters as closely as possible. So, and then just it iterates over time. So, uh, when would you actually use k-means? Like, why would this be something that you want to do? Uh, it's pretty simple, right? If you want to find, it's an unsupervised learning. So, imagine this is not data that you already have labeled with a group. You're trying to label it with a group. Um, so, this can have good business assumptions around, uh, like, say, if you're trying to figure out uh, buyer behavior by segmenting them into a particular group or finding anomalies. All right, so let's get to the demo. So can I use clustering uh, machine learning algorithms to find which wine comes from which vineyard? All right. So, of course, I'm here at the bottom. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And this is all available on GitHub, so if you can't see it so well now, uh, you can definitely just go. It's, it's all here on my, oops, it's all here on my GitHub. All right. So we're going to use this. This is just a Jupyter Notebook. We're going to be using Apache Cassandra, Apache Spark, Python, this Jupyter Notebook, and k-means. And this is a real data set. It's available here. Um, you can just go and pick it up and use it for this. Um, so what are we trying to learn, right? Using the qualities of the wine, can its vineyard be determined? Can we find its cluster? So these are just some Python packages that I need to import. So I'm going to do that. And this here is something just a little funky. It's essentially when we're going to be using some scatter plots uh, to look at the various clusters. And so what you can do is you can, you can create a scatter plot, but you have to actually tell it to display. And that's what that's doing there. So let's run these. And this is just a nice function um, to show just like our data frame in a nice pretty format. All right, so first what we're going to do is we're going to take that data set, we're going to load it into a table. But before we do that, we need to connect to our cluster. And we're going to create a key space. So in Apache Cassandra or DataStax, um, instead of like a schema or a database, it has uh, a key space. And so I'm just going to create it here if it doesn't already exist, and it's called wine and chocolate. So uh, in this case, don't really worry too much about this, but this is just our replication strategy. So we're just going to do a simple strategy and with a replication factor of one because I just have a single node here on my laptop, right? It's not a cluster. But this is what I was talking about before. This is if I had a proper cluster, I'd set it to three. So I'm just going to set the key space so I don't have to um, worry about that anymore. And then we're going to create a table called wine. So I don't want to get too much into Cassandra data modeling, um, but we do need a primary key. So this primary key is how our data is actually going to be distributed across the cluster. Um, and so what I'm going to do, it needs to be unique. So I'm just going to generate an ID, and I'm going to use that to partition my data. So I'm just going to create a, an ID called wine ID. So this will result in an even distribution of the data, but you'll have to utilize the primary key when you're using, doing your where clause, which, again, we don't want to talk too much about data modeling, so I'll just show you that below. But so I'm basically, I'm just creating the table off of all these columns here, and I'll run that. So which are the, so there's 15 columns here of the different attributes in each one of these wines. So I don't want to go over each one of them, because it's a lot of things to, to talk about. 
But essentially, we have our wine ID, which we just created randomly. Uh, it's just a random number. Then we have our cluster. This actually, remember we've been talking about with k-means that it's an unsupervised learning? Well, this actually, um, we actually do have the labels. It is, it is a supervised learning. Um, so because of that, we can actually do some nice comparisons to see if we're actually getting kind of the results we were expecting. So we're, we're not cheating because you may, this very well may happen to you when you have this type of data set, uh, but it's just interesting to see. So here we have basically three vineyards. We have vineyard one, two, and three. And it's, like I said, it's already been labeled in the data set. Then we have like alcohol content, uh, malic acid, things like that. Things that are making up the properties of the wine, of the plant that grows in that vineyard. All right. So then we're going to actually load that from the CSV, which was so nice in the CSV file. I didn't require any pre-processing. I was just able to load it just straight away. Um, I'm just iterating through and doing an insert. I could have also like used like a bulk loader or something like that, but just for the sake of this, because it was a small data set, I just looped through and loaded it. All right. So then we're going to do a select star just to ensure that we actually loaded the data. And this is what I was talking about before where we need to utilize that where clause. So I just picked a random ID that I know I had generated to make sure that it was there. And it is. All right. So now we're actually time for Apache Spark. So what we need to do, again, because I'm using Datastax Analytics where the two are co-located, I can just build a, I can get a Spark session here. And then from there, just using this one line of code, I can load all that data that's in my table in Cassandra and actually load it into a Spark data frame. And so that's all this line here is doing. So once I do that, I can just do a count on the table to see that all of my rows from my table went into my data frame. And they do. I have 178 rows. And so I can just do a show on that wine table. And again, we're just kind of seeing, again, that wine ID and all these properties. And then I just want to highlight this is the cluster here by the vineyard. So let's visualize, oops, let's visualize this data with a scatter plot. So in this case, what we're going to do, our x-axis, because we're trying to find a unique data point for each wine, right? So in this case, we're going to use on the x-axis the alcohol content and the protein on the y-axis. You say, why are we doing that? We're just doing that to make sure that each point in each wine is unique. So these are just two easy ones to make sure it's unique, but we probably could have chosen other properties as well. And the color of the dot will be assigned based on if it's a cluster, on uh, the cluster that it belongs to, basically the vineyard. So, and we're just trying to make sure they don't overlap. So let's create this scatter plot here. Okay, cool. So straight away, we're seeing three clusters, just like we imagined, right? So here in blue is vineyard one, here in green, and I apologize to anybody if uh, we have any issues with seeing the difference between red and green, because this is kind of difficult to see. But uh, cluster two is green here, and then vineyard three is in red here, here at the bottom. So we're seeing those three clusters. All right. So let's actually see if k-means will give us the same output. That's what we're looking for, right? So again, it's an unsupervised learning algorithm, and it's used to solve clustering problems. So what we need to do with k-means, um, it needs to have uh, your, your uh, columns, the elements in the row, you have, when you're using it with Apache Spark, you have to make it into a vector. So we're going to assemble our vector here. And in this case, I'm just going to add all of the columns that were available to me, um, except I'm going to remove the cluster, the cluster column, right? We don't want to, it doesn't mean a whole lot, and we don't want it swaying anything in the data or in the result of the data. And then I remove the wine ID because that's just something I generated. It doesn't actually have any properties uh, with the wine. So then we'll just create a new data frame based on it now being a vector. So then here, this is actually where we're going to start doing the k-means and building our, our model. So we're going to set the k here. Remember, we talked about the number of clusters that we wanted to create to three. And then we're going to fit the data and generate our model. So one of the downsides of k-means, even though, I mean, look how easy this is. It's just two lines, right, of building this model. One of the downsides is when you, you have to set that clustering in advance, and because you do that, k-means is happy to just distribute your data just like you told it. So if I said separate this data into six clusters, it'll do that, even though I know, because right, this is just a pretend data set, that there's really only three. But it'll happily do that. So you just, again, data science is an iterative process, right? 
Uh, so you just keep going back through until your results are making sense. So then we're just going to transform um, our training data set with our model and get our predictions. So here I can just show some of the predictions. Let me run this again. Okay. So here we see our original cluster. And over here we see our prediction. So like in this case, in this first row, we see cluster 3, but then prediction 0. Now don't be alarmed. This may, this may be wrong and, and wrongly classified, or like it doesn't, the prediction has no idea what the labels are actually called. So 3 could be 0, 3 could be 2. Um, that's a little bit confusing, but nevertheless. So what we can do here is just to try to get like an eyeball on it. There's a couple different ways that you can try to verify this when you do have a, a supervised learning situation like here. You can do a confusion matrix or a matching matrix. In this case, I'm just going to do different things. I'm just going to do a count on each one of the predictions versus our original cluster, see if they kind of line up just by this quick eyeball, right? This is just a demo, right? So let's just quickly eyeball it, see if it looks the same, then maybe we got good results. And then I'm going to do another scatter plot. So then we can just quickly see if it looks like our original scatter plot. So if we do a group, uh, we do a count here. Actually, the numbers are not looking, not looking too bad. Look like it's lining up pretty nicely. But let's look at our scatter plot and see if it's the same. Okay. So in this case, we're seeing here in the green, which it labeled one, which in our case was uh, vineyard one. So they happen to have the same label. It seemed to classify that pretty well. Seems like it's able to determine clusters um, from vineyard one, the wines there, pretty easily. But here on this uh, vineyard two and three, it's kind of struggling. I don't know if you can see that so well in the back, but it's kind of struggling there. So again, um, one of the downsides of k-means is that the more variables that you add, the more difficulty it has in actually uh, determining the clusters. So let's see how we are doing on time. I've run through this a couple of times, uh, but basically, essentially, what I'm doing is I'm starting to strip away uh, things that I don't think are necessarily going to add to the clustering, right? So maybe the alcohol content. Maybe that's not going to affect uh, the wine and which plant it comes from, or maybe the ash or the color. So I'm going to remove those and then run it again and then see if that affects it. So just because I want to make sure that we can get to our next uh, demo, I'm going to skip. I did two of these here. The, the results are it didn't work so great. <laughs> Uh, so let's move on to the last one here, because that was kind of the winner. So, okay, let me move down to the last one. Okay, so the very last one here I decided to do, and actually it's kind of funny because I got that first set of results. I mean, this when I was really doing this, I got that first set of results that didn't look so great. So I thought, oh, you know what? I'm going to remove it all the way down to just two variables. I'm going to remove it to just the variables that we're actually using in the scatter plot. Let's see what that will do. Well, that was actually our winner. So if I just use the alcohol content and the protein in the wine, and I put that into my, uh, I, vec I do a vector of that, then I train my model and do my predictions. Okay, and then I do my counts. Okay, my counts are lining up pretty well. You just kind of eyeball it. And then I do my scatter plot. And boom, straight away, you can see it's clustering it perfectly, just like how we originally had in our original clusters. So that was it. The wine, the alcohol content, and the protein content are really the elements that make it, you can shoot, know which wine belongs to which vineyard. So again, just kind of a reminder that data science, again, it's, an, it's analytics, it's a science, it's an iterative process, it's all about hypothesis, testing, and analysis. And so let's talk about classification. So classification, again, just like clustering, it's pretty straightforward of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to identify a set of categories. Um, so if we train our data set on some known categories and how they're labeled, that when we have new ones, we can also, um, we're going to be able to predict those based on the training that we've done. So a good example of like classification would be um, like in our spam in our, in our email inboxes, right? Spam versus not spam. So it's basically a pattern recognition, right? So sorry, there's a lot of text on this, but naive Bayes, uh, or naive Bayes, I always say it wrong, uh, is a simple technique for constructing classifiers. So you're going uh, to generate a model that assigns class labels to uh, 
various problem instances. That's kind of some fancy language for, in our case, the rows of data, right? So there's actually many different algorithms that have been implemented uh, for Naive Bayes, uh, but they all assume kind of the same set of things, which is the value of each particular instance feature, right? So in our case, like the columns in our row of our, of our item that we're trying to classify um, are all independent. Okay, so now we're gonna go to our second demo, which is Naive Bayes and Chocolate. So can I use a classification machine learning algorithms to find which country a candy bar comes from? Ooh, that's the end, okay. So let's switch to that now. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing, same kind of thing, so I'm gonna go walk through this one a little bit more quickly. Um, so again, if I have some information about a chocolate bar, can I predict which country the data uh, that it, the chocolate came from? So again, this is a real data set. Uh, I found it on Kaggle. Um, but also, it's, it, again, it's not only is a real data set that's out there on, on the internet, but it's actually real data. Um, it's the Manhattan Chocolate Society. They actually maintain this data set. Yeah, right? Who knew? <laughs> So I just have a caveat here. Because this is an actual real data set, this is not a demo data set, um, the results from this data set are not crystal clear. Right? Normally when I do demos like this, I generate my own data so that way I can get these nice, you know, 90% accuracy, uh, right? It looks real slick. But this is actually real, so we're gonna see that when you're working with real data, sometimes you don't get those crystal clear answers that you're looking for. Uh, okay, so we're just gonna do our imports here. And again, we're using DataStax Analytics underneath, under the hood as our back end. We're gonna to connect to our database, create our key space. And again, we're gonna create a table of our chocolate table. Same, same way we're gonna partition the data in Cassandra by our primary key. Again, I'm just the same kind of thing. I'm just making it a chocolate, I call it chocolate ID. Okay, and so in this case, we have way less columns than we had on the wine. We have our chocolate ID, we have our company, so that's like the company, uh, the name that actually produces this chocolate bar. We have the bar location, uh, like where the specific bean that created this chocolate, where it originated. We have this REF ID. Uh, it's not really important, but essentially what the higher number it was, the more recently the chocolate bar had been rated. Um, then we have the review date of when it had been rated. The co uh, cocoa percentage. So the higher that value, right, 70% cacao, 60%, right? Then we have our company location. That's gonna be the key. That's what we're actually looking for. That's the manufacturer's base company. Then we have a rating on that chocolate bar, anywhere from one to five, five being, you know, it's an awesome chocolate bar. We have the bean type, like the actually variety of the breed of the plant, and the bean origin. So again, like where it's on the geolocation of the world, right? Okay. So now we're going to load this CSV file. So in this case, this was not like the wine data set. This data set was actually very ugly. I had to do quite a bit of cleaning, uh, removing a bunch of things. Um, it was not prettily comma separate delimited, right? Um, so if anyone's interested in this data set, I actually do have it all cleaned up uh, and able to use. And I have it on my GitHub. So I call it chocolate final because it's the final one that's finally clean. And you can even see here, I'm still doing a little bit of cleaning. Uh, it's still not perfect, but right, there's only so many hours in the day. So what I'm gonna just loop through each row and then insert it into the database. Then I'm gonna do a select star just to validate that it's actually there, which it is. Okay, so same here, what we're doing. So we're gonna create that Spark session and then we're gonna connect to our table and then create a data frame from that table. So we've moved our data that was living in Cassandra into Spark into a data frame so that we can use machine learning on it. So in this case, we have uh, 1,700 rows. And I'm just gonna do a show here. Again, we can see the chocolate ID, the company location like USA, New Zealand. Also, because this is a real data set, you're gonna see a lot of misspellings. Uh, you actually can't see it here, but the whole data set, instead of France, it says face. <laughs> just go with it. So because we're using, again, this is different than k-means, we're using naive bays, and so we need to be able to split our data set into a training and to a testing data set. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna split it 80-20. So we're gonna put 80% of our data into our training set and 20% into our test set. So we do that, okay? So that, that seems like 80-20 split. 
So naive Bayes, again, is a classifier algorithm. And we need to predict a label. Um, we need to tell it which label that we're trying to predict on. So that way it knows, right? So uh, a couple of things. Each of these, to be vectorized, needs to be a float. It can't, uh, if we're with uh, Spark, some actually naive Bayes that I've used on other products uh, actually could take in text input, but this cannot. So because of that, um, I'm going to need to take, uh, because the bean origin, like the, uh, where it was actually grown, that's a like, text. So we actually need to create a float based on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a string indexer. And it's going to be each time it sees a new instance, it's going to give it an ID. So it's basically taking our, our text and making it into a number, right? a number identifier. And in this case, every time I see a new one, so after a certain point, it'll say, if you, you keep seeing new instances, uh, maybe I'm just saying, OK, that's enough. I don't need, I don't need a 1,000 different indexes uh, for this. But I'm saying, yeah, go ahead and do that. I'll take a 1,000. That's fine. So uh, again, I'm just transforming this uh, into my data frame. So I'm able also to do for my company location. That's the ultimate label that I wanted to label it with. And again, uh, same thing with the k-means. It actually needs to be vectorized. OK. So here we can see, let's see, our company location. Oh, yeah, now you can see it, face. So face has been labeled as 1. So every instance of face is now 1. And we need to do this for our test set as well. And we vectorize that. All right. So now it's actually time. So now we've just been doing all this prep to get into the data frame. Now we're done. Now we're actually able to use naive Bayes. So I'm going to set this up. I'm going to fit the model with my training data, uh, fit the model with my training data and get a model. Then I'm going to use that model, and I'm going to put my testing data and score it off of that model to get my predictions. So let's run this. And then I'm going to show that. So here we have our, so in this case, face. So, uh, so that's one. So if we go over here to our prediction, OK, straight away, we're seeing it was not able to predict that. It's giving it a prediction of 12. But so let's take another look here. So we can see in this, uh, it actually wasn't able to predict it at all. Anywhere where it was France, not the same. Oh, actually, USA, it was able to predict that correctly. OK, great. So now, because of this, we can actually use a multi-classifier uh, evaluator to give us our percentage of how, how well we were actually able to score this model. Because we do have a training set, right? So let's run that. All right. So we got our test accuracy was about 20%. So 20% of the time, if you know the, the cacao percentage, where the bean was grown, and the rating, we can figure out which country of origin that the, the candy bar was actually produced. So it's not a great value, right? You'd like to see 90%. Right? Uh, but this is a real data set, and so I wasn't able to do that. Actually, originally when I had started working with this data set, what I wanted to show you was I wanted to show you if I knew all these things about the, bar, the chocolate bar, where it was produced, the rating, how much chocolate, you know, cocoa percentage, that I could determine the rating. I thought, oh, that'd be really interesting. That's how we'd know if it was a good chocolate bar or not. But actually, the, that uh, test set accuracy was just, it was really bad. It was horrible. So I said, okay, I'm going to go with this because at least I'm getting 20% here. All right. OK. All righty. So we're wrapping it up. That was awesome. But now what do I do? So again, like I said, this is all on GitHub if you want to take a look at it. Uh, if you want to learn more about Cassandra or Spark, uh, so we have DataStacks Academy. Um, it's free online that you can um, utilize to learn more about Cassandra and DataStacks. And you can follow me on Twitter. I, uh, I post a lot of just the stuff that I'm doing, and sometimes I try to post interesting things. <laughs> And thank you.